for as long as people have been taking time to observe the sacred, we've been eating about it. Some anthropologists are beginning to think, um, I, I studied anthropology, I studied culinary anthropology, but the physical anthropologists have been looking at the way humans evolved, and there's this interesting shift that happened where, you know, uh, where, um, there's this kind of, you know, interesting omniv omnivorous species that kind of stays about the same, and then there's this leap where the brain got bigger, and that leap is part of the evolution to our current species, which is still evolving. And some anthropologists have looked at that leap and looked at, at what we have um, and have come to the theory that the reason this leap was even possible was because um, these species began learning how to cook food with heat. And what happens when, when food, when, when things get cooked with heat, it, it makes them more easily digestible. And it frees up more of the nutrients, and, and it's easier to get the calories out of the food. So more calories from the same amount of food, more calories from the same amount of work to go collect all the food. And more calories then means bigger brains. Because bigger brains need a lot of calories. Brains burn a lot of energy. Um, a human body at rest, not doing anything particularly exciting, the calories being burned at rest, about 20% of those calories are just to make the brain work. And if you're busy learning something new, the calorie intake goes up, or the calorie burning goes more. So, so um, Sitting through a boring sermon burns fewer calories than sitting through a sermon that, that, that's more compelling or makes you think more. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to do my best. Let's burn some calories this morning. Okay, so the idea that cooking is what made it possible for the species to evolve, for our brains to get bigger, which of course is a little more difficult during childbirth, but um, this just leaps us past Claude Levy Strauss, bless his heart, who never saw a dualism he didn't like, um, but he said that culture is cooked. The reason we have culture is food. We, okay. This new theory jumps us I'm just going to wait there. Okay, all right. This new theory that the brains evolved because of cooking, um, it gets us to the idea that we are a species that evolved because of cooking. And I bring all this up because I want us to understand that we're beginning to suspect that cooked food is really important for us as a species, for our progress as a species. Right. Nothing against raw foods, it just it keeps you really busy. I'm also going to, I will also always argue that the way that we eat and the way we talk about food is a primary way that in our culture we construct and maintain our identities. Hell, in, in a lot of cultures, how identity is constructed and maintained. Um, and and this, this becomes very important. He's doing it. I know he's doing it. Yeah. Okay. Using food and food talk as a way to construct and maintain relationship and identity is very important in a pluralistic society, all right? And when we gather to consider our deepest commitments, and that's how James Luther Adams defined faith, our deepest commitments, when we start con contemplating our deepest commitments, we find that food is over and over again a major way that humans have reinforced communal ties, right? Uh, communal identity. So the whole keeping kosher. The kosher dietary laws really don't have a health benefit. They're not about improved agriculture. They're about separating the Hebrew people from their neighbors. We eat this, but not that. 
we prepare our foods this way, but not that way. That's about group cohesion. Over and over again, we see the way we eat together is a means of marking our observance. So the, the earliest Christians sharing bread and wine to, to um, making merit as Buddhists for giving uh, food to the monks. All of these are ways of tying something that is otherwise very basic, every day, can't live without it, to something that's larger than the self. Mm -hmm. Every religion, I've studied, I've studied a couple of them, every religion uses food as a way of rebinding, relocating religion, rebinding the individual to the spiritual and the community. And pretty much every religion also uses some kind of dietary restriction um, as, as a means of focusing the, the individual on their gods and, and, and how to separate the distractions of this world. Which, if you've ever been through a fast, if you've ever been on a strict diet, you know how it can really focus you on something. Yeah. What about us? What about Unitarian Universalists? Uh, we don't call for fast days. We feast anytime we feel like it. Um, we don't separate ourselves from the rest of the world by um, the way we eat. Some of us eat meat. Some of us don't. Some of us choose organic. And some of us don't. Some of us grow our own food. And some of us go buy it ready-made. So do we have any real shared dietary codes by which we can identify one another? Not really. But that doesn't stop us from judging one another uh, about food. Um, this is true in some congregations more than others. Um, I've been with one congregation where as a body, they agreed that they would not use congregational money to purchase any foods from um, confined animal feeding operations. That was their decision. And so the, the dairy products at Coffee Hour were all organic. They, they brought vegan snacks for their children. I know at least one congregation where if you showed up with a bucket of fried chicken to potluck, <laughs> There would be somebody who just lectures you about bringing unhealthy foods for our children. It's always about our children. For our children. This is why I love y'all so much. Y'all are cool with donuts. And, and fried chicken. And quinoa. And kale. All kinds of foods. Y'all do potlucks really, really well. I like that about you. Because um, you don't really seem too nervous about trying to maintain some kind of culinary orthodoxy. Um, you're really generous with one another. You show up with actual food. Um, that's way more important to me than whether the hummus is organic. And I've been told that usually it is organic, but you know, I don't, I don't, I'm just happy that there's a lot of it. When I came to, to visit, I started looking real carefully at your potluck culture, um, because I knew it was going to tell me a whole lot about the habits and the culture of the congregation in general, and, and it's because potlucks are as old as Christianity itself. We'll go talk about the early Christians another day, but I want you to know this. Our potlucks are a window into how good we can become at accepting and even welcoming difference among ourselves. And that's not easy work. It's, it's, the, our work isn't that easy, because as, as Unitarian Universalists, we, we, we really kind of... We, we didn't make it easy on ourselves because we, we uphold both the individual search for truth and meaning and we recognize that we're all in this together. 
All right? And, and that ain't easy, um, trying to, there's a tension there between the individual and the group. And um, because everything depends upon dinner, we quickly come to the challenge of how are we going to eat well a bunch of individuals in a group? Well, first off, I really recommend that we just let go of some of the old stories, the old ways. Um, the idea that, uh, you know, everybody's going to enjoy the bread and the wine. Um, we have to let go of one of my absolute favorite stories. My favorite story, the stone soup story, that we all are going to bring something to the pot. And we put it all in the pot, and the pot becomes rich and wonderful. And then we all eat from this collective single pot. <gasps> oh. But that doesn't work so well. Not now. Probably never really did. Um, there was probably always somebody who didn't have anything to put in the pot and everybody made that person feel a little less welcome. Um, there probably was always somebody who couldn't actually eat half of the ingredients in that pot, so um, I guess I'm going to go home. So just like we have already rejected a single common creed, I think it's good that we just sort of reject the single soup idea too, all right? Instead of that old ideal, perhaps we have something else nearby that we can work with, um, one that's based upon our understanding of deep generosity and curiosity and, and welcoming. We're already doing this work. Let me show you. This congregation is already doing this work. Here's what I mean. Mm. We're very busy with the work of embracing religious plurality. And it's inherently challenging because, once again, we have the individual and the community. Um, and, and the problem with the whole thing is, is that I might find myself sitting next to somebody with a completely different theology than mine. I mean, I might be um, an animist who understands that the world is suffused with spirits and, and, and that, that every river and tree and rock and rainbow trout is, is, is expressing their inherent spiritual energies. Um, and sitting right next to me in a UU congregation, there might be a sweet, kindly person who is a raw-boned existentialist. Somebody who knows that there is no inherent meaning in the universe. That death is death and life is now. Oh dear. How are we, what, what do we have to say to one another? How, how are we going to be with one another? We're going to be patient. We're going to be patient with one another, but are we just going to be stuck at polite and patient? How do we sit together on a Sunday morning with all of our differences, not just tolerating, but embracing? It gets easier if you have a strong mission, a shared purpose, um, a shared set of goals. There she is again on that vision and goals and missions. But the same challenges and the same delights exist with a potluck meal. Okay. How will everybody, people, individuals with different tastes, different needs, different understandings, how will they have a good meal together? How will they walk away somehow better connected and well fed? Because like a good potluck, like Unitarian Universalism is like uh, the community of differences each person brings their theology with them. Each person reflects upon this and refines it, honors it, shares it, and remains curious and respectful of the theologies that others have brought. All right? Now, to make sure we don't all show up with chips and salsa, what if instead of assigning uh, dishes by your last name, um, A through D, bring salad, E through K brings such. What if what if we all were asked to bring dishes based upon our theologies? 
Some of us might understand that God is simply whatever that is that is holding all of the atoms together in the universe. Nothing more, nothing less. Those people, could they please bring the plates and the napkins? Some of us might be panentheists, that God is eminent in all things, or, or religious naturalists, or able to understand God through observation of the natural world. Religious naturalists. Those folks will be assigned dessert. Okay? Some of us might find, some of us might find the holy. The holy is in that space between one another. The space between the mother and the child. The space between the I and the thou. The holy is in relationship. That's relational theology. Relational theology, if you got it, bring a side dish. Some of us might not even be working with a God construct at all. Some of us are probably actually living perfectly well without any need to pause and consider the atoms or the spaces or anything. Will those people please bring um, the salads? Some of us find guidance and comfort in a personified divine. An angel, a father, a mother, a wise mother or father that, that is attentive to and accompanies us through our joys and sorrows. If that is your theology, uh, we ask that you bring a main dish with protein, please. Some of us understand God as this verb of becoming, becoming always in this process of creating, creating this moment and this moment, and all parts of the creation are co-creating this moment and this moment. That's process theology. And these folks will be asked to help with the process of cleaning up. Well, some of you are wondering, uh, what about humanism? It's because I understand that it is possible to live as a humanist while holding any of these different theologies. That's because being a humanist at its most basic is understanding that the lived human experience is important. That's it. It's human affirming rather than denying. Humanist is not synonymous with non-theist or atheist. You can be a religious naturalist humanist. You can be a mystic humanist. You can be all kinds of ways. But understanding that the human experience is important. For those of us who place human experience as their deepest commitment, um, could they please help with the setup? Okay. Now seeing what diversity of thought is possible when we gather together. See how the quinoa salad and the Buddhism reminds us that suffering can be alleviated? See how the roasted squash and the homegrown tomatoes tie us to this season and this land that is so generous? You don't have to eat everything that's on the table. You don't. In fact, you might really only wind up eating the food you brought, and that's okay. However, when we're gathering to share food, let me, let me say, we are going to create something larger than the sum of all of its parts, so I'm going to encourage you to be very care-filled as you prepare what you're bringing. Start with your understanding of the all that is. Start with your understanding of what is holy or your understanding of what is God and bring food that upholds that understanding, that relationship. Bring what feeds your own needs and then bring enough to share. Explore what others have brought. You don't have to eat it, but ask questions. Listen to the story that is 
tied to every single recipe. There's a story tied to every recipe. Even if the recipe is, it's just what I had in my, in my kitchen this morning. There's a story there. And because some of us are allergic to carrots, and some of us cannot digest soy, um, it's really a kindness to the community to label the ingredients in your, in your dish. Don't go presuming that tofu is completely harmless and, you know, uh, or that a little red wine won't be noticed. It might be absolutely delicious. But it could also make someone else unwell. It could pull somebody off their path. Likewise, I think it's really good to examine our theologies that we're bringing and consider the key ingredients, how they could be helpful or harmful to another, and be honest and respectful and humble about these differences. And then, as the meal is spread out upon the table, as we begin to fill our plates, we will sit down together to fill our tummies and our souls with the communion that is of time and place. We will chat with people we already know. We will welcome in newcomers. We will help one another carry the plates and the cups to the table. We will laugh and listen and learn. And we will begin to create what some have called heaven around a table. And whatever we bring to share, we will be generous. Generous in our humor. Generous in our creativity. Generous in our curiosity. And generous with our love. That radical kind of love. Love across difference. So let us be together according to our covenant. And when we eat together, May we eat very, very well. Blessed be. May it be so.